Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. There's no doubt Australia has been successful in flattening the curve. But what are the chances of a second wave of COVID-19 infections? The relaxation of social distancing measures across the country coincided with tens of thousands of people taking to the streets in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Let's discuss the potential fallout with Professor Jodie McVernon, Director of Epidemiology at the Doherty Institute. Hi Jody. thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, how worried are you by what you saw on the weekend? Sure. So obviously in Australia, we've worked really hard and the community has been incredibly diligent in reducing the risk of spreading COVID and in adhering to rules about restrictions on gatherings and so on. So obviously seeing tens of thousands of people on the streets concerns us greatly about the potential for spread of infection, particularly because those are people who are coming together from different places, meeting together and then returning back to their usual homes and, and workplaces. So clearly there's a risk of transmission in gatherings of this kind. We were pleased to see people taking individual risk mitigations uh, and trying to keep distancing, but in a crowd of that size, that's very challenging. So it is a concern. Obviously, there's been some easing of restrictions in recent weeks, and also we had the long weekend in parts of the country uh, over the weekend. It might be a couple of weeks before we see any sort of further transmission uh, in the community. And so what point could you see restrictions possibly being reintroduced if we start seeing uh, new cases spike? So clearly the objective in Australia has been to take a really staged and graded and measured exit strategy, if you like, or in easing these restrictions to make sure we don't have to go backwards and forwards, because that clearly has big implications for the public confidence and for small business owners who are easing things up. It's, you know, terribly um, disruptive to have to go back again and may actually, you know, collapse some businesses. So the, the overall situation is being monitored very closely. We have a pandemic health intelligence plan and that sets out a series of criteria looking at case numbers, but also at the capacity for public health units to keep up with any small outbreaks if they occur and for the capacity of the clinical services to be able to manage cases. So there's a really rounded, nuanced appraisal and that happens every few weeks and is reviewed by the National Cabinet. And so it could be a few weeks before uh, any decisions might be made for, to, to sort of say, you know, we can continue heading in the direction of easing uh, that we're heading or um, perhaps there needs to be some pullback on, on the restrictions that have been eased. So look, there's a three weekly cycle at the national level of reviewing overall progress and we're coming up for another review that's, that's been since the restrictions were first eased. But also too, there's obviously recognition that individual states and territories are in a different stage of their pandemic. Some have had no cases for many days, others are still seeing cases. And so there is flexibility within those arrangements for those governments to make their own local recommendations. In some parts of the country, it's starting to feel like life is returning to some normality. Kids have gone back to school, pubs and clubs are starting to open up in a limited way. But what would you say to people who feel like the crisis is behind us? Well, I think we've really not had a major crisis yet. So those who think COVID's done and dusted, we really have had very little of it. Uh, and that's put us in an enviable position globally, but we are still a highly susceptible population. There are still cases in our community. There are still people coming into our country with COVID and um, we must be remain vigilant, remain cautious uh, and stamp out any cases and, and small outbreaks that are observed as soon as they occur to not get into that situation of having widespread community transmission. Sporting events with small crowds are starting to resume. Uh, what would be your advice to anyone who's starting to go to that kind of uh, event? So we know the things that are the most protective for everyone. And, and we're starting to talk about something called macro distancing, which is, you know, these restrictions on the number of gatherings and, and you know, movement controls and so on, and micro distancing. And micro distancing is every individual's responsibility. It's what we do every time we step out of the house to reduce our risk of getting infection. It's about maintaining distance. It's about not going if you're unwell. It's about maintaining good personal hygiene and cough etiquette and washing your hands and sanitizing your hands. Um, it's about doing all of those socially responsible things that keep yourself safe and the people around you safe. And so, you know, adhering to the group sizes, but also adhering to those practices in an ongoing way is what's keeping our community safe of COVID. Okay. Now, the World Health Organisation has revised its advice about wearing masks. There's been so much mixed advice on this, or, or at least it is applied differently in different countries. What's your perspective and, and how should Australians interpret that advice? <laughs> 
Sure. So everything needs to be viewed in a risk-based context. And when WHO puts out advice, it's putting out advice for the world. And very few countries are in the situation that Australia is in of having little or no community transmission. So there are some very clear rules, you know, surgical respirators should only be worn by clinicians in high risk settings. Medical masks really are for use in medical environments and we need to preserve those for our health workers. Um, there are recommendations in that document about the use of non-medical masks for some people in public, but we need to bear in mind that there are many individuals in other countries that have a high prevalence outbreak, uh, who for economic reasons may have to go back to work and be in, in crowded environments. And in those sorts of situations, WHO is providing pragmatic advice about reductions in risk, but really masks are at the bottom end of a pointy pyramid of ways to reduce risk and not going out if you're unwell, physical distancing, all of these other hygiene measures are actually much more effective and if you do wear a mask wear it safely because wearing a mask can actually increase risk if it's worn inappropriately or if it means that people keep touching their faces more often or we've all seen plenty of people on tv with their nose hanging out of the top of a mask which means it's really not worth wearing at all uh, that's really really practical advice and really interesting to, to hear you say that you know on the scale of all the other measures that can be taken it's it's you know not a big one now new zealand has zero cases they're removing all restriction restrictions except for border restrictions what do you make of their approach look it's a really difficult situation and we understand um in, in all settings that where there are very few or no cases, there's a strong desire of the public to resume life as normal. But as I say, we still are in a risk environment and while there are any cases, there still is a risk of outbreaks. We look internationally and look at countries like South Korea that have done a great job of managing their outbreak, you know, and then have a, a large outbreak associated with a nightclub venue or another one associated with a, a packaging warehouse. So. These things are still possible and it's why vigilance needs to be maintained. Australia's taken a more graded approach, a more staged approach, uh, but obviously we'll be, you know, wishing them well um, in, in resuming that activity. When do you think we might start seeing border restrictions eased with countries like New Zealand or, or indeed others? Could it still be quite some months away? Well, clearly that's a really nuanced conversation and ultimately a political decision but it requires a lot of confidence. It requires confidence of those countries that have achieved low levels. You know, if New Zealand has no restrictions on mixing, they're clearly gonna have a very high risk threshold for imported cases. And if we're going to make those, um, you know, restrictions across borders be eased, we all need to be able to have the confidence that those low levels of transmission um, in the potential importing state or country um, are going to be commensurate with the level of ease that we have in our own populations. So these are really important issues and being carefully thought about, but it's not simple to, to put a timeline or, or a set of criteria on that decision. So one thing that could uh, allow perhaps some of those restrictions to be eased further is to find a vaccine, but then there's no actual guarantee that we'll uh, have a viable vaccine that can be easily distributed. Can you give us any update on Australia's role in this? Um, uh, the latest that I had heard is that there are trials expected as soon as July. Yeah, so Australia's engaged with um, a large international consortium called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and that's been running for some years now. Um, in, in anticipation of disease X, so the next emerging infectious disease, whatever it may be, and actually has put in the preparedness investment in a range of vaccine technology platforms that might be pivoted towards an emerging virus. And in fact, SOCEPI is funding a, a number of activities and two of the vaccines that are in its sites um, are being trialled in phase one trials in Australia imminently or now. So one is actually um, made by Novavax, an overseas company, and being trialled in Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, the other vaccine is one that's being led out of UQ and in, in partnership with CSL, and that uh, is going into phase one trials in July. Um, so it's exciting. This is one of many vaccines around the world that are going into these early phase one trials to be sure that they have no immediate adverse effects and that they do generate antibody responses. We still have a long way to go to be sure that those vaccines will be protective, that they won't potentiate harm or a more severe disease profile. And obviously there's a massive investment in manufacturing capacity alongside those early trials. So there's a big gamble being taken because actually being able to produce enough vaccine for all of the people who will want it uh, will be the next challenge and, and ensuring that's equitable and, and um, globally um, sustainable. Mm. Now, a lot of the work that you do is about using data to model or predict how scenarios unfold. How challenging has it been considering the huge amount of data and the reliability of that data during this pandemic? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I think one of the great preparedness um, activities has been the sort of development of WHO of informal modelling networks. So I've benefited from that. And on the 17th of January, they convened their first COVID modelling call. Um, that was interesting in bringing together a range of epidemiologic modellers from around the world to peruse what information was available and how to interpret it. And really in those early phases, the bulk of it was from media reports. So I think um, from my own perspective, you know, we all look at levels of evidence and critiquing, but so much of our understanding of this epidemic has come through media. Um, obviously we've had global information sharing and WHO has done an amazing job in collating that and other centres like Johns Hopkins with their global dashboard. Um, but we've had to look at very different sources of evidence and even looking at the clinical evidence from high income countries where we might expect to see high quality data. Many have had overwhelmed health systems that have made it hard to necessarily be able to extrapolate their experience to our own or to collect all the information we might want in the time frame. So it's really been a matter of trying to piece together emerging insights and information to get the best quality evidence we can and, and obviously in Australia um, to be able to characterise our local epidemic and our challenge here now is we have so few cases that we're not actually able to generate much of our own evidence which is a, a nice problem to have but it means that we have to extrapolate a lot of our understanding of this disease from what we see elsewhere. Right. And, and how about lessons for the future? You know, uh, how um, do you think scientists and, and others will respond differently based on the lessons learnt during this pandemic? Look, I think um, every time we have an event like this, we learn a bit more. You know, my, one of my favourite quotes is, try again, fail again, fail better. So I think um, in this event, as in others, there are things that have worked very, very well. And where they have worked well, I mean, I talked about the WHO modelling network is one of my own experience where, you know, there was already a coalition of, of willing parties. There's been rapid sharing of information, rapid pre-publication of findings to really get that information out there. Um, where there have been these coordinated efforts, CEPI is another example, where there have been platforms and, and preparedness networks set up in advance, they have really shown benefit. And I think in other areas, we've probably been scrabbling to catch up a little bit where, you know, trying to get information together or trials or other things where those platforms haven't been there has been more difficult. But, um, you know, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we did and didn't do well. Um, but, but, but learning. I think the other thing about this particular event, though, is it's been extraordinary in so many levels. None of us ever had lockdown written into our preparedness plan. So I think as this one in a hundred year event, it's also taught us many new things about what we might require of populations and how they can amaze us with their response. And I think, you know, the Australian community is to be congratulated for the efforts they've gone to really to reduce the spread of this disease because they're the frontline health providers here. They're the people who've actually halted this epidemic, um, you know, and together with the public health response and the clinical response and all of that preparedness together, this whole of society response is, is what has us in the position that we're in. Well, Jodie, congratulations for all the work that you've put in and the, and the results uh, that, you, that you've been part of uh, helping to produce. And thanks again very much for your time today. Thank you. And remember, if you're looking for further information about COVID-19, our website has plenty of articles and videos, all fact-checked by experts. Just head to science.org.au slash COVID-19. I'm Paul Richards. See you soon.